Good morning, all, and welcome to the officials from the Ministry of Finance and the Auditor General's Department. My name is David Renat Tanku, and I'm the Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. The Public Accounts Committee has a mandate to consider and report to the House on A, appropriation accounts of monies expended out of sums granted by the Parliament to meet the public expenditure of Trinidad and Tobago. B, such other accounts as may, be, as may be referred to the committee by the House of Representatives or as are authorized or required to be considered by the committee under any other enactment. And C, the report of the Auditor General on any such accounts and whether policy is carried out efficiently, effectively, and economically, and whether expenditure conforms to the authority which governs it. The purpose of this virtual meeting of the Public Accounts Committee is to have a general discussion with the Auditor General of the audit process on the report of the Auditor General on the Public Accounts of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year and the 30th of September 2021 and to determine the challenges being faced and the possible solution to these challenges. Based on the issues identified, the following key stakeholders have been invited to today's Public Accounts Committee session. The Auditor General's Department and the Ministry of Finance. This meeting is being broadcast live on the Parliament's Channel 11 on Radio 105.5 FM, and on the Parliament's YouTube channel, PalView. Viewers and listeners are invited to send their comments related to today's inquiry via email, pal101 at ttparliament.org, via Facebook at forward slash ttparliament, or via Twitter at ttparliament. Participants are reminded that their microphones should remain muted until recognized by the chair to contribute. And now I now invite members of the Public Accounts Committee here present to introduce themselves to those uh, invited guests. Members of the committee, my colleagues. Yes. Morning. Jillian John, John, member. Jillian John, member. Good morning, Paula Gopi, school member. Thank you. Good morning, Raja Monroe, member. Thank you, members. Can I now ask members of the delegation from the Auditor General's Department to introduce yourselves, beginning with the Auditor General herself? Well, good morning, Chair, and thank you for having us this morning. My name is Laura Lee Tuhada, Auditor General of Canada and Tobago. Good morning, Chair. I'm Louis Hernandez, Assistant Auditor General. Good morning, Anita Langa, Senior Legal Officer, Are those all the members of your department good, attending with us today? Good, yes. good morning, all. Jacqueline Degans, Audit Executive 2, Auditor General's Department. Good morning, Neela Sukra, Acting Audit Supervisor, Auditor General's Department. Good morning, Chair. Mr. Sheila, sitting on Assistant Auditor General, is supposed to be present this morning, but he's experiencing some technical difficulties. He may enter in at a, at a, once his technical difficulties have been resolved. Thank you very much. I now turn over to the Minister of Finance for that delegation to introduce themselves, beginning with the Permanent Secretary, Madam. Good morning, Chair and members of the Public Accounts Committee, <laughs> General and her staff. Um, members of the viewing and listening audience, my name is Michelle Durham Kisun, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Finance. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Lachman, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Finance. Good morning, Chair. I'm Catherine Laban, Controller for Accounts, Ministry of Finance, Treasury. Good morning, Chair. I am Nalisha Bali, Deputy Controller of Accounts, Treasury Division, Ministry of Finance. 
Good morning, Avanel Rasta, Treasury Director, Treasury Division, Ministry of Finance. Good morning, Chair. Brahmin Oral BDC, Commissioner of Inland Revenue. Good morning, everyone. Sabita Lal, Acting Commissioner, Board of Inland Revenue, Ministry of Finance. Thank you all very much. Welcome. I will now ask the Auditor General to make a brief opening statement. Hi, good morning, Chair. Once again, thank you for having the Office of the Auditor General present in this meeting. As you are aware, the Auditor General is charged under the Constitution, Section 116.2, to audit the accounts of the public accounts of Trinidad and Tobago. And what does the accounts of the public accounts of Trinidad and Tobago entail? The accounts of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago involves the accounts of the Treasury, which includes the public debt, among other things. It also involves looking at the appropriation accounts submitted by the accounting officers of the various ministries and departments. It also involves looking at the revenue statements and statements received by the receivers of revenue and the accounts of administering officers of funds or trusts. This year, we were particularly challenged um, because the COVID continued, and it had an impact on our resources, as well as it also had an impact on the resources of the ministries and the departments in which we have to audit. So we were particularly challenged. As a result of that, we tried to assure ourselves of the assurances that everything was working as the way they should be, um, because the risk portfolio of these ministries and departments had increased, due to the fact that offices sometimes were not present, that the control element, which generally involves the internal control element, may not have been present because officers may have been on home on COVID or on quarantine or other related items. So this year, we continue to focus on trying to ensure ourselves that the control, control functions function. We focused as well on following up on the COVID-19 expenditure because we noticed that COVID-19 expenditure had continued to be applied. And um, we also tried to bring, make greater linkages between subventions issued on the current transfers and subsidies from the various ministries and departments. And so this year, we focused on the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government and the subventions that were submitted to the regional corporation units. We also tried to make linkages between the COVID expenditure of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance with those of the regional health authorities and other entities. And, um, and so I think um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my staff who have worked relentlessly, not only the audit staff, but also our administrative and accounting staff and IT staff during this very trying time. And I will just um, put my, my report was made and I made it before you today. And I'm open to any particular questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Auditor General. I would now invite one of the represent one of the permanent secretaries um, in the Ministry of Finance to make a brief opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning again. Um, my opening statement will be short. I just want to thank the Auditor General for her report. We appreciate the opportunity to have an independent view of our internal controls and the measures that we need to improve. So thank you once again, and we look forward to responding to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Permanent Secretary. I want to join with you in uh, recognizing the importance of the role of the, Auditor, of the Auditor General and the Auditor General's Department in ensuring that the public accounts are kept uh, current and ensuring that uh, money is allocated, uh, expended in the directions and so on that they are supposed to have been. Um, during that process, uh, we have the generation of these reports, and usually these reports are, highlight the concerns and the queries and issues of non-compliance 
Um, given that you, I accept that we would have had some challenges on the basis of COVID, I'm curious as to find out from the Auditor General what a general assessment is of the integrity and competence of the public services financial management accounting and information technology systems and what recommendations you would make for improvements. Um, okay, thank you very much, Mr. Naku. Um, I would like to say that um, we did not really pursue this year uh, in-depth analysis of the information technology systems that exist. Um, we do have this down as a priority for us to pursue in this financial year. Um, so we, we did not get an opportunity to really analyze the proposed system, which is supposed to be implemented by the Ministry of Finance which is, I believe, is the integrated financial management system. We are aware that the public accounts report as submitted by the Ministry of Finance has highlighted certain initiatives which they have embarked upon and at the stage in which they are. However, we were not able to um, actually go through and do an in-depth analysis at this, at this point in time. With regard to recommendations going forward, as you know, across the region and across a number of other, other colleagues, I am fully aware that the integrated financial management systems are in place and have been functioning for a number of years. With regard to that, we would obviously hope that such a system is implemented with some great deal of speed and with the necessary control mechanisms built into the system to facilitate the data integrity of the information to facilitate the proper outputs coming out from the system and to facilitate proper management of the financial management system of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, ma'am. Given that these some of these issues are raised on a, on a continuous basis, some of these very same issues with regards to the non-submission of cash books, etc., non-presentation of documents for review, it's a, a continuous uh, issue that has been raised by the Auditor General's Department over the last multiple years. Can you advise, ma'am, what your general opinion is of the effectiveness of the internal audit systems across the public service and what recommendations you would make to this committee and to government by extension um, for improvement so that we don't have some of the very basic issues that have been raised this year and have been raised previously uh, being raised again next year? Okay, thank you again, sir. As, as I've indicated before, the government system is basically um, at present a manual system. And as a result of that manual system, sometimes information can be misplaced. Information, the result of information and the use of digitalization for the storing of information is actually a critical element in ensuring that the integrity of information data is maintained properly stored and easily accessible. Um, so I, uh, because the system is manual, it is a system that has been legacy system from since pre-colonial days. And as a, as a result of that, it is very cumbersome. There needs to be a look at their whole information portfolio and how information can be extracted, be more accessible and data saved and the, the integrity of data maintained. Um, if I may, sir, I would like my Mila Supra, who is one of our acting audit supervisors involved in our IT audit technology arm of our office, to just give some ideas of some of the challenges that she has faced, if, if you will allow us to permit us to do that, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we had a lot of challenges um, during our audits. We have seen where archaic systems actually prevent um, ministries and departments from making informed decisions based on um, errors they may have in their databases and in their systems as a whole. And um, most of the times, you would find that these systems, because they can be updated 
they have no um, maintenance agreements and stuff. Um, you cannot you cannot generate certain reports from it. So you find that you have errors going along, and you may have a lot of payment errors, and you will have wrong information in the um, information systems. So these were some of the errors, the issues that we had with the information systems. Thank you. Thank you. You raise a very important issue. Uh, basically, when the information is provided, is when there are errors such as you have described. Once there are errors that have been provided, um, it means that the decision making is challenged because you may be making decisions on the basis of incorrect or incomplete information. When those are highlighted, highlighted by the, uh, the Auditor General's Department, can you indicate then, outside of just highlighting it, what is the role of the Auditor General in terms of following up on the recommendation? Well, two things, following up on the issues highlighted for correction, and what is the, the, the role of the Auditor General in terms of uh, pursuing corrections? So it's, it's two, two things. You, are, you have identified the, the error, you have identified the mistake. I'm trying to find out what the role of the Auditor General is in terms of having that mistake resolved and putting in place a mechanism to ensure that it doesn't repeat itself. Let me take over here, Chair. As you know, the role of the Auditor General is that of an independent auditor of, state, of the financial statement as presented by the various accounting officers and as presented by the Ministry of Finance in terms of the various public accounts. However, as part of our audit procedures, um, we do tend to have ways with the entity to identify what they are prepared to do to implement changes. We do this by way of manage, what we call management letters. The entities are normally required in writing to respond to us as to what they are prepared to do and how they are prepared to address it. In terms of the addressing of these, the responsibility for the addressing it will definitely rely within the realm of the accounting officer and the Ministry of Finance. Um, we will follow up depending on whether the item is deemed to be a short-term fix or a long-term fix. We are required at the beginning of each financial year to review the challenges that we have found in the previous ministry and to do a follow-up with the entity to see if those more things have been resolved. Some of these things, of course, would need to be resolved on a longer term, term basis. So we would therefore need to see that your strategic direction is including the resolution of these issues. Um, the implementation is not within the realm of the role of the Auditor General. However, what is required is for us to actually continuously bring it to the attention of the Public Accounts Committee so that the method can be aired and spoken to with the relevant entities. Thank you very much, Madam Auditor General. Um, in your opinion, can you give us uh, well, your opinion as to how you found, what, what you have found in terms of the receptiveness of the relevant entities to your recommendations for improvements? I'm just trying to get an idea of, of, uh, well, of I like what... Say, I would like to say from, um, I've only sat in this chair, this will be my third year, going on my third year. But what we would have noticed over the years is there was, uh, in the earlier years, our management letters were not given the due respect that they deserve. However, over the last few years, um, predating myself, there has been a greater appreciation by the ministries and the accounting officers in recognition that we are there to bring forward to them things that they may not have been aware of themselves. And there has been an appreciation to try to implement within their strata as much as they could to improve upon their system. Again, of course, because the system is such a legacy system, and it is a system that has been built on over the years, we're now not necessarily looking at it from a holistic point of view. It does continue to be a bit of a bureaucratic 
and it does contribute to provide some constraints for even the accounting entities and the accounting officers to implement changes rapidly. Um, um, so, but I would say that over the last few years, there has been a greater appreciation for the role of the Auditor General and for the, the recommendations that we have made is with regard to our comments within our management methods. Thank you, ma'am. Would it have been your experience in conducting your research that there are different types of uh, accounting practices in various, uh, under various ministries? Or is it that you have a standardized structure, standardized method of doing business, um, standardized uh, reporting mechanism, so that uh, all ministries across the board follow the same process and procedure? Is it is it that there is such a, a standardized method? And if there is, is it the responsibility of the Auditor General to reach into ministries or to advise ministries or to train um, ministries to ensure that the documentation and the information you get is as required by your entity, by the Auditor General's department? And so I would like to say that the Expected Audit Act defines the roles and responsibilities. The role and the responsibility of monitoring and ensuring internal control mechanisms is not vested with the Auditor General. That role is vested under the Expected Account with the Ministry of Finance, and it is charged under the direction of the controller of accounts. Um, Generally, this, this role is standardized across the board. Presentation is standardized across the board, generally by circulars issued by the controller of accounts in terms of presentation of the format of the financial statement and in terms of the presentation of the format of the statement and receipts and disbursement. In terms of also the format of the infrastructure development fund, circulars are submitted by the controller of accounts as to how that presentation is supposed to go. And the rules in which the data is captured, accounted for, and recorded are, in, are defined in the Exchequer and Audit Act. Further directives are also issued in the financial instruction and in the financial regulation. And further control mechanisms are often issued under the Ministry of Finance by way of the control of accounts to aid accounting officers in maintaining the internal control processes of the financial management system. Thank you very much, ma'am. I want to turn over now to my colleagues if they have questions that they would like to raise at this point. Chairman. I recognize member Gopi Skoon. Thank you, Chairman. I may have to leave a little early, and this is the reason why I jumped in so quickly. And first, let me place on record my really uh, my my appreciation and thanks that we are sitting here today and, e and we are able to really examine this report of the Auditor General and the Public Accounts Committee for this year, um, uh, um, 2021. I'm saying so because of the very challenging circumstances on account of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in addition to the challenges across the country and and with all of our families and so on, the staff in particular was also, the staff of the Auditor General's Department was also hard hit. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased that they were able to complete their, prioritize and complete their key areas to present this um, report to us. So um, coming out of the uh, earlier discussions, I um, I've one thing I'd like to place on record as well that I do look forward to the integrated financial management system being fully operationalized and functional. Uh, so I, I say that, um, and also I wish to, uh, when I was speaking of recognition, I also wanted to say that I really do appreciate having the special report on the follow-up audit of the COVID-19 expenditure at the municipal corporations and RHEs. Again, appreciating the prioritization to um, bring to our attention. Um, but um, so, so just a very general question for me, whether or not there were any material errors um, or fraud or illegal acts or, or deficiencies that you um, in any of the heads of expenditures um, audited as part of the 2021 public accounts that you would want to bring to our attention. Um, I'm, I'm, 
um, saying so, um, going through the 200 page documents, but um, uh, in terms of material, um, errors of fraud or illegal acts, I would want you to highlight any of these if you may please. And, and give us a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have brought to the attention of the offering uh, those items that we think uh, that should have been addressed. Um, in terms of speaking of materiality as it relates to fraud, as you know, the Auditor General is not a forensic department, and we would not be able to really speak to the issue of fraud. There are many items and issues where control breaks down, which have an increased potential for fraud to, to accrue. In these instances, we noted that there were some challenges in the revenue area and the revenue collection area in which reports were reported officially um, and uh, for some misappropriation of funds by certain elements. And I believe that these things are still under investigation by the appropriate entity, which is the PCPS. Uh -huh. um, but uh, there were challenges in terms of that during the COVID period, and we did receive reports from the various um, entities in which these things fell. And we did allude to it, but we cannot speak directly to it because uh -huh. we are not the investigating entity involved in it. Um, I don't know, I'd like Mr. Hernandez here, as he was particularly involved in COVID-19 and the care of the regional corporation and the regional health authorities. If you would like to add any further comments to my thoughts. If that makes the chair, through you, Yes, good morning again, all. Um, concerning the COVID expenditure, um, it, the, there was no fraud per se. What you, what you found is um, some lapses in internal controls and maintenance of records. For example, where you had certain systems to go to be in place for the distribution of um, hampers and so on, you would have found that um, there was no accountability so how they were distributed, you had large sums of money spent and you had no um, record of whether the, the items reached the, 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 um, the persons, those um, persons who are vulnerable, right? And that, that was the objective to, to help those who need, who are needy. So in many instances, we could not verify that that objective was satisfied. Further, um, when, when we even went on to do the subventions, we found that certain um, entities didn't keep key records. Um, it may not lead to fraud, but it, it would have had to do with errors by not maintaining certain records so that they could reconcile and so on. Yeah. Can I follow up? Sure. Uh, so please, um, so maintenance of records seems to be an issue and that is, might be, I can say, uh, might be a pervasive issue and um, recommendations are probably are made, I know, by, by your good office. Uh, are you finding that there are any instances where the recommendations are not being taken on board? Or in a, and I'm, this is a very general question. Yes. Okay. Like for example, the, the chapter on the COVID expenditure, that it yeah. was a follow up, and we, you found that in in, twin, in in prior year 2020, there were many um, instances of lack of um, proper record keeping. In 2021, which was the follow up, you found um, we found that there was some improvement, and in okay. addition to that, where where there were lapses, we. For in the responses to our management letter, we, we did get some assurances that um, systems that we put, put in place to maintain the records. Yeah, but on a more general level, you would find, I mean, you, 
I, I, I listened to the comment earlier where you said you were so pleased, but you are pleased, not so pleased. I would go to, won't go to the superlative, but you were pleased with, in a general sense, with ministries having the appreciation for the public accounts committees um, to be uh, to, to be present and, and understanding the work that they do and so on. So I'm just extending that to a very general sense um, in terms of the implementation of your recommendations. So these are being done. Just a, just 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 a comment from you on that. Okay. Yes, gen generally, um, recommendations are put in place. But what we do is, uh, in the following year, we do follow up to ensure that what was said, it's it has been implemented. So, so between 2020 and 2021, were there any, um, um, were you able to identify that there may be unresolved matters, not from 2020, for instance, that were um, not addressed uh, and, and reappeared in 2021? Understanding, of course, that 2021 was a, a year of special circumstances and you may not have gone, the, you did not go the round of the particular ministries and you selected particular um, ministries and, and and agencies for um, for um, auditing, but are there any any particular between 2020 and 2021? Are there any particular carryover um, uh, matters that you or unresolved matters um, that you could identify that were not addressed and reappeared? Yes, yes, there was some some at some entities we found that um. So, um Matters weren't addressed. There were recommendations. Um, some responded that they were going to put um, systems in place, but we found there was a repeat. It, there were no there were no improvements, but it was not the majority. For example, right. I, I have one or two. We found that it, they actually implemented. I would say a mod, model system. A two, a two, a two of the corporations. Uh -huh. They actually put systems documentation in place for controls to ensure that, that there were no leakages. Excellent. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. You know, there's something that also bothers me. My last question. Um, you, um, you see these overpayments recurring and um, and you highlighted again, there were 140 cases of overpayments, and but not to any material amount in that it was 400,000. Uh, is there, put, could we put a system in place to avoid this? Is there, have you documented a, and recommended a clear system that would avoid that or? It depends on the individual circumstances of the ministry. I'm not sure, but you keep seeing this all the time. It's recurring. Yeah, um, I will just um, jump in here if I need. Overpayments, I think um, it's, a, it's, it is re it's a requirement that we account for overpayments, but a lot of the overpayments don't report it because it is a requirement in the financial and checkers act that it, uh, compliance take place with regard to overpayments. Occur in the name um, with regard to the processing of salaries. And that the impact of overpayments generally has to do with the movement of staff. So two things can occur with regard to the overpayments and the movement of staff. One, staff may be acting in a higher position and um, because of that higher position, they are not entitled to certain benefits, which would have, or they now may be entitled to certain benefits, and they've now gone on extended sick leave or sick leave, or they've gone on vacation leave and they have not in, um, earned the right to have the benefits in that position that they were acting to. And because of a timing difference, they may have been overpaid. Now again, this, this problem will obviously Somehow, because and the other thing is locations, you might find you have a lot of old payments in the Ministry of Education because you're dealing with people who are outstations, principals, schools, school districts. The information flow may not have been received in a timely manner and in accordance with the time frames in which the um, the, the salary payment cycle is being addressed um, in the time to cut it off from the person having received the payment. So there are a number of little challenges that go with it um, that is basically is the cause of overpayment. I, I don't know going forward when we have um, become fully digitalized with regard to the integrated financial management system, 
um, and that being integrated with the global payroll system, whether or not this interface and this interaction may help resolve the timing differences that tend to occur, which give rise to the overpayment as it relates to salaries of public servants and teachers. And thank you very much for that explanation. And I think we really need to see that interface. I think it's going to solve a lot of problems going forward. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Chairman. I pass over to you to another member. Thank you. All right, before I go to Member C. Passad, I want to uh, go back to a comment made by Mr. Hernandez in which he indicated that no evidence was really found of fraud in the assistance programs during the COVID-19 uh, period. Uh, however, in the document itself, the Auditor General's report of 2021, there were several instances where a substantial amount of uh, inconsistencies were discovered. So for example, with regards to the public assistance grants, there were 673,504 instances of incomplete information in critical areas. With regards to the disability assistance grants, there were 1,238,235 instances of blank fields of critical areas again. Um, and the same can be found elsewhere. And these, are, these relate to substantial amounts of money. So for example, the senior citizen's pension on page 88 that you referred to, there was a 404 instances where check number was zero and bank account was also zero. And there was, that's an account of one point something million dollars. So I understand that you have reported these inconsistencies. However, I think it's, it's a, a bit general to say that there was no fraud because clearly there's a substantial amount of misinformation um, that was provided to the, the relevant agencies with regards to these particular grants, the public assistance grant, the food support program, the disability grant, and the senior citizens pension. Um, and because that information was, uh, because there was such, so, so much missing information, it meant that we could not necessarily account or determine whether fraud did or did not take place um, in those circumstances, because it's, if you bear with me, it's, it's a little strange that we have 1 million plus instances of blank fields on our database, especially when you're dealing with things like national ID cards, which did not match up with data boots and so on. So I would not want to, to leap to the conclusion that there's no fraud, uh, except that the rule of the Auditor General is to identify the issue but I think thereafter, the Auditor General should be, by maybe by a management letter or so on, uh, make some recommendations and suggestions for substantial correction. So these kinds of things do not happen. And maybe there should be need for the ministry, relevant ministry, to initiate some sort of punitive action so somebody could be held accountable because a substantial amount of funds have been expended under these grants with circumstances that are lack, that are substantially less than acceptable. I don't know if you agree, Mr. Hernandez. Hey, Mr. Chair, um, when, when I spoke just now, I was actually speaking about the special report on the COVID expenditure and um, transfers and subsidies um, from the Ministry of Local Government. So it, was, it didn't relate entirely to the whole report. So it, it was gener generally to the um, COVID expenditure, um, chapter six. I take that. Then, then my question then to the, to, to the Auditor General is whether or not these uh, substantial errors in the, in the uh, documentation that would have been supported, supplied to these various, to the ministries with regards to these various pension program, the senior citizens pension, the disability grant, the public assistance grant, whether the Auditor General is of the view that something is necessarily amiss here um, that warrants additional information or, or additional action on the part of the ministries responsible. 
share. I would not want to say that something was admitted. However, in conversations and, and through the management letter and responses of the management letter, first of all, an investigation needs to be ascertained as to whether or not some of these differences and instances that we found were in fact input errors because they could have been accounted for by input errors because, again, it's a human being inputting the data. The second thing is that we recommend that ministries, the Ministry of Social Development in particular, needs to look at their system and develop proper monitoring and verification processes and reconciling to, to ensure that the data that is being inputted is accurate, therefore minimizing the risk of these instances occurring in the future. The ministry was on board with those recommendations. In certain other areas, it was unable to ascertain whether or not perhaps there was an increased risk that an activity may have been of a fraudulent nature. And we recommended to the ministry that they look at those areas with a view to ascertaining whether or not a fraudulent practice had taken place. Um, the accounting officer was on board with that. I would also like at this point, for because this was done via our IT audit stream, and it was done verifying and analyzing data and looking at the input fields that were created for the data, I don't know if, we, if you could allow Ms. Neela Supra or one of our team leaders and our team members who was an um, integral member of this team to provide further information in this regard. Chair? Yes, thank you. Hey, is it? Um, when we looked at, when we asked the ministry for this data, it was as a way of looking at the database to ensure that what what the data, what was in the database was correct and um, complete. Previously, we had thought, we had looked at the information system some years ago, and we had identified certain issues with the database. So now when we looked at it, we were of the view that they would have taken our recommendations and they would have probably updated the database to reflect the correct stuff. Now, what they did say is prior to um, 2019, the data in the database may have been incomplete and there may have been errors, but after that, they would have put in validation into their database to ensure that when a user put in data, that the system will validate it and it should be correct. Now, there's, there was also some errors and some instances where there may have been um, a validation issue where there may not have been any persons checking the data after someone puts it in, probably a clerk or a data entry person. So if they had those issues. So some of the um, issues identified may have alluded to input errors. It may have also alluded to the fact that the, the software doesn't identify the, um, doesn't validate the data that goes in. So for example, you will have an, an ID card number which is supposed to be like, I think it's 11 digits. So the software is supposed to identify it. If you put in nine, then you will get an error. And that wasn't happening probably prior to 2019. So you have all this data in the database that would have been incomplete. So the ministry, um, we had exit meeting with the ministry and they have advised that they are currently doing a digitization project where they are trying to clean up the data and look through person's files and actually match um, or fix the errors that we have, highlight, have high, highlighted in the reports. So that's a process they have undertaken. Um, they have responded to our report and they are actually investigating some of the issues that we have highlighted. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Just out of curiosity, um, I'm looking at page 88 of the report. Um, given your indication that some of these things may be uh, computer data entry issues and so on, we have 108 instances in which the age of the senior citizen's pension ranged between 27 years and 64 years. That means that persons who at 24, 25, 26, 27, et cetera, were able to get a senior citizen's pension. That process means that somebody would have had to apply for that information to go in 
to the data, the data system, the data collection system, and for that processing to take place. So it's not just the errors in data entry. Something is clearly amiss where we can have 108 persons, 108 instances in which somebody who is clearly not going to qualify for a pension actually receiving a pension. Or, or maybe you can advise under what kind of, it's your, it's your opinion right now that I'm asking for, as opposed to a factual uh, statement, because the Auditor General did indicate that this has happened where persons so between 24 and 60, 27 and 64 were able to get a senior citizen's grant. Um, what circumstance would have created the situation where this could actually happen? Um, I'll, I'll ask, I will start off and then I will let Mr. Croft. Um, we have indicated that there were instances where we found the age of the recipient in, range from age 27 to 64. Now, again, we are looking at a particular field. If, for example, the person was born in 1993 or 1939, but instead the person has inputted 1993, um, that would be an instance where it would appear as if someone of a particular younger age has actually received a benefit. So I just want us to be clear here that this is data analysis and the ministry is responsible for doing an in-depth investigation to ensure that those instances, because the details of which were presented to them, uh, that they would further investigate to be assured that in fact, people within this age group were in fact not the ages that the data seem to have represented. Ms. Sukra could provide further details if she wishes on this comment. Sure, Madam Auditor General, would it then be the case that the Auditor General's Department, having flagged this, would then have expected that the ministry would then give them a response, give you a response indicating that an assessment has been done and uh, this matter has been resolved? Yes, sir. We would follow up on this matter. And as Mr. Pratt did point out, that the ministry has in fact gotten the details and they have indicated that they are in the process of investigating. And we would expect a further response from them. But if none is received, we would be, as part of our ongoing process for the subsequent year, this would be flagged as what we would call, in a generic term, we would call it keep in view, which means that when we go back in, we will seek to see whether or not, in fact, further steps were taken to address the challenges that we raised and the issues that we raised, and this matter was being resolved. Thank you, ma'am. And when then would those corrections, suggestions, this, that feedback, when would that feedback be provided to the National Committee via the Public Accounts Committee? Um, so we, we have now, just, just to clear up the question, we have now your, the copy of the Auditor General's report for 2021. We have issues emanating from this, which you would then send back to the ministries, the relevant entities, for corrections and suggestions for clarifications. Um, at what point then do does the Public Accounts Committee get the updated version of uh, those clarifications and corrections? Let me do a specific follow-up on those data, sir. It would be presented as part of our report in the subsequent year. So for 2022, we would identify whether or not any corrective action has been taken with regard to those things, those items that we have planned. Um, it is not part of the general process right now, but you've raised a very interesting procedural aspect in that perhaps we need to look at our own systems and look at perhaps having a more detailed follow-up structure in which that particular follow-up can be presented to you through Parliament as a separate report. But at present, this is not the system that is currently administered at present. Okay. I thank you. I think, I, th I think that's an excellent suggestion. I want to hand over to um, Member Chair, if you'd mind, Chair, if you'd mind, I just wanted to investigate on the same matter of under discussion. I just wanted to intervene. Sure. Just 
to place on record, I mean, because I, I recognize the, the, the discussion is a serious one, just to place on record that the Minister with Responsibility for Social Development and Family Services did come to the population um, more recently at the, uh, the the variation of appropriation financial 20, 2022 bill, and then and before that in the um, in the to the parliament in um, I think last October uh, in a, in at uh, the budget debate uh, identifying the situation in the, within that ministry of several investigations ongoing and some at a very sensitive stage. Uh, some of course being investigated by the financial intelligence uh, financial investigation bureau and the anti corruption investigation bureau and Fort Scott and so on. So I put it on record to so because I don't want it um, to go. On notice that the that the minister has um, it has been speaking openly to the public uh, through the parliament and through releases about the situation um, ongoing at the ministry at the particular ministry. I just want to put it on record. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Schoon. I also want to put on record that a lot of those explanations came as a result of questions. However, what is being requested now is, in fact, uh, a different type of response, which is specifically based on the, fact, the corrections, based on the issues specifically raised here, the corrective measures that, were, that have been taken, and the processes which would have been put in place to penalize whatever uh, whatever or who, whomever would have been or could be held liable for it. I want to turn over now to Member C. Passat, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my, my question is more broad. I am concerned about the major unresolved matters from the 2020 audit, which was found to come forward in 2021. If, if um, Mr. Harris could identify that and tell us what is being done to address these issues because from my reading of the reports there seem to be a recurrence of the same issues year after year and um, while it's good to report that's not enough we need to fix the problems and um, deal with whatever underlying issues there are um. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite clear um, exactly what direction the question is being asked for, because again, I would like to draw attention that it is not the role of the Auditor General to implement the accountability framework invested strictly within the accounting officer's realm and under the limit of the controller of accounts. However, as part of our ongoing strategy, we do attempt to bring to the attention um, those issues that continue to be pervasive, that continue to be material, with the view that recommendations coming forth from the Public Accounts Committee would tell those who are ultimately responsible for the implementation of systems for the improvement of those systems. Um, with regard to some of the issues in terms that I think you're talking about, internal controls and these sorts of things, the remit of the internal control functions fall under, again, in the exception, if you presume the exception, would fall under the control of accounts. That having been said, we have noted that there have been a number of um, circulars coming forth requiring accounting officers to take particular action of the internal control stream. We've also seen that there is an attempt to um, upgrade and um, improve the training element of the internal audit functions and those who act within that realm across the ministries and, and departments, that there is an attempt to improve on their competencies and their skill sets. Um, so we would, you know, and, and basically these are the things that are being addressed by the agency that is responsible for addressing those things. So again, um, thank you for your question. What I'm really trying to find out is what is a list of recurring issues that you have identified um, that keeps coming up year after year. That's what I'm trying to, to get a handle on. May I ask that if we may present that to you at a later date in time, please? Yes, that would be fine. 
um, I also would like to ask you about your um, resources. That is the resources within your um, the Auditor General's department. Um, are you adequately resourced? What is your level of vacancies? If you could, could address that. Yeah. I kind of give you the detailed figures of the level of. Um, we did present in the beginning of the year at the Standard Finance Committee that we had a significant shortage of both in the professional and in the technical stream. Um, however, um, within recent times, we have received some funding to bring on board at least 10 professional officers who have, were interviewed by the Civic Commission Department with, with, um, two years ago. And so we are at present attempting to bring on board at least 10 of those. We have a, a vacancy of 17. And to date, as of yesterday, one person thus far has come on board of, of the 17 outstanding one person that is within the professional stream. Um, within the technical stream, we, came, we, have, uh, we, we have vacancies of um, going into the year. We had approximately 40 something vacancies with those within the technical streams. And that is, those are people who do not have their full professional capacities, but they do have some technical capacities within the accounting stream, accounting and auditing stream. Um, to date, we brought on board approximately, I think, I do not want to give you the incorrect figures, but we do still have a significant number of outstanding. Um, from the list that was created by the Civic Commission Department, I believe that we still have at least um, six or seven of those to bring on board. A number of them who were interviewed and who found acceptable by the Civic Commission Department chose not to come on board. So um, we have to actually go back to the Civic Commission Department with a view to getting interviews taken place again, because we still have a significant level of um, technocrats that positions that are vacant. I don't know if that um, answers your question adequately. And how are the, this? How are these um, vacancies? The fact that we don't have a full complement of staff affecting your ability to carry out the audit functions that you are charged with. Um, could you repeat your question, please? Sorry, one second. Um, I'm trying to find out how is the level of vacancies that you have affecting your ability to carry out your mandate? Yes, ma'am. It has significantly impacted on our ability to effectively manage our mandate, not so much from the public accounts arena, but really and truly, we have an extensive mandate because our mandate includes um, statutory bodies, regional corporations, a lot of these other entities, um, NALIS, um, Central Bank, ADB. And so as you can see, our portfolio is, our portfolio is wide. And therefore, it has impacted on our ability to address some of the other portfolio items that we need to address. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question I have, it concerns the um, financial management system. I don't know if it could be addressed by the Ministry of Finance, because that seems to be um, an ongoing theme that the, the overall financial management system needs to be um, addressed. And um, I need to, to find out or get some indication of when it will be fully implemented so that you don't have to have the same theme of legacy manual systems creating issues um, with your audit and with um, being able to record the financial data in an accurate I don't know if the Ministry of Finance um, could, could assist in answering that question. Thank you, Mango. Through you, Chair. Um, yes, we do recognize in the Ministry of Finance and throughout the public service that the integrated management financial, the integrated financial management information system is in need for implementation. We have been aggressive 
in preparing to rule out that system early in fiscal 2023. We are, as you may be aware, um, this program it is to support, as you rightly said, the public financial management um, system and the modernization of it. Um, and of course, the tool is the main tool is the the computerization, the whole digitalization, and for us to all have real time data. At the moment, we are addressing what is called the chart of accounts, and that is basically the classification of the the revenue and expenditure that you would see in the estimates books, both the revenue and expenditure. Um, we are currently reviewing the design of that to make sure that it is um, can accommodate all of the information that is required to address the issues that we are speaking to this morning. Um, we are well in advance. Um, we, the system is to be compliant with the government financial statistics, which is an IMF, um, an IMF designed um, classification. We have also prepared a program for training of ministries and departments. And um, we have a few pilot ministries and we are expecting within the next um, month or two to see how we can go live with those pilot ministries. I don't know if um, I can ask my colleague, um, P.S. Lachman, if she would like to add anything with respect to our aggressive rollout of this program. Um, thank you, Chair, through you. Um, yes, I endorse everything that yes, um, you would have indicated. Um, earlier, uh, one of the things that, one of the comments that was made was um, the issue of overpayment and specific reference was made to Ministry of Education and um, the timing difference in getting the information. The IFMA system would um, would resolve that issue, and as yes, it is indicated because it's a a, a real time system. Information will be available to um, to those charged with the um, authority of making decisions immediately, and um, therefore, as she indicated, we are aggressively pursuing the full implementation by um, the next, the first quarter of the next fiscal. Okay, um, and to support that as well, just to add, um, we would be also seeking to strengthen the internal audit function, you know, which would be supporting that system. And in that regard, just like uh, the Auditor General has implemented the risk based approach to auditing, we would also be seeking to fully implement the risk based approach to internal auditing. So that would also be there to support our IFMA system. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Member John, I see you have your hand up. Can you intervene now? Yes, Chairman. Thank you. All right. Um, sorry, I've been following the conversation, and I think there has been quite a lot of good questions asked. Um, I want to ask the Auditor General, please, through you, Chairman. We, I would just want to go back a little bit to the errors of, um, well, there were some errors within the report, sub, uh, the Auditor General report, and there was a discussion about the, the errors that were seen over and over, and not to belabor the point. In terms of errors, whether it's errors of omission or errors of commission, given the fact that there, there's the, the, um, what has come out is that there's a challenge within the management information system, how does one determine 
that the error is not one that is um well intentional in terms of um something that hinges on on a fraud because i don't know how bad the mis is in light of the fact that uh, i know these ministries will have their own way of managing their data whether it is outdated um databases or so on i don't know but at least we have the the tools of the um the spreadsheet etc how is that determination made please through chairman um, thank you Ms. Jones, for your question i just want to point out that in the main the ministry system um the payment system is a digitalized process however the, the supporting system in terms of the records and the management of those records are very much a manual system, right? Um, the, uh, the, the errors are basically within the realm of, of normal consistency. We would normally do analytical review and assess the level of the errors. The errors, while we are raising them, it's because they're not in compliance with the Exchequer and Audit Act and the regulations that are cited. Some of those errors would point out to a risk, perhaps a need to be strengthening the internal control function. Um, as I'm happy to hear Ms. Lutchman, um, P.S. Lutchman indicate that the internal control function is going to be built, the control controls function is going to be built into the IFMIS system, which might help mitigate some of the errors that have been coming forth. Um, but by and large, the materiality, because we would have to do alternative testing to verify the information and the record keeping of the manual system, we are pretty much assured of the integrity in most cases. Of course, the larger risk area um, is not so much in the expenditure area, with perhaps the exception of development and infrastructure development programs. Um, because of this, the, the control mechanism built in by the exchequer is very, very strong. Um, the, the issue sometimes that we would need to look at with greater detail um, and emphasis has to deal with the revenue collection and perhaps potential leakages that could include um, as far as the revenue collection is concerned. Um, those, I think, would be um, uh, stimulate a much greater risk. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm too much, gentlemen. What are you really saying, um, did Madam? You, did you all hear me by any chance? Did you? Yeah, what, yes, did I heard you. Did I come to Yes, 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 yes. No. I, I heard you just now. I have. Ms. John, I'm not hearing. No, I'm hearing you. I don't know. Oh, my God. Oops, 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 oops. Hello? Yes, no. Yeah, I, I heard her, the um, Madam Auditor General. I just had a little, a little contraption here in trying to keep my laptop up. All right. Um, now, with respect to the, I heard you speak about, I think, the chart of accounts and that you were following a IMF model. Is it that there, there must be something in, in place right now? Why this IMF um, suggestion or their model? Is it that it brings more rigidity? Because as a matter of fact, the chart of account is kind of linchpin. And to, I've never been an auditor, but I have been in places where that have been audited. And basically the fundamentals are as important as the in and out of your cash or whatever it is of your resources. So with respect, when you go in, are you looking at the fundamentals? And I would have heard the chairman mention earlier, I think, about the standardization of this, or someone, one of the members of AXA, about the standardization of um, these fundamentals across your network. I think the issue of the chart of accounts and has to be better be discussed with regard to the, again, with the Ministry of Finance. However, the fundamentals, as I indicated to you, this is a cash-based system. This is not an accrual-based system. The government accounts is very much on a cash-based system. So what does that mean? The cash-based system is basically stimulated on, as you know, a vote book system, which is dealt down by a lines of expenditure, starting with the head of expenditure. Mm -hmm. So it is really basically, basically you receive a release. You account for that release. There's proper recording of that release. And then you, you are entitled to spend only if you have received the release. 
Prior to that, there is a system under Section 18 of the Extract and Audit Act, which calls the application of credits. And that means that is the authorization, that is the very beginning, where you are authorized to spend up to a certain level of expenditure. There are documentations that needs to be gone because this is a formalized, again, manual document that is utilized to control expenditure and to control the levels of expenditure that can be done by an accounting officer within a particular period. Um, and so there are supporting support documentation that is linked to that. And in terms of the expenditure, before anything that can be put through into the payment system, there are all, the exchequer again defines certain controls mechanisms which relates to the expenditure system which must be adhered to and followed. So from a fundamental basis, as part of our audit, and this is why we bring up these instances, because sometimes while the control may not, we could have looked at alternatives to make sure that the expenditure was bona fide. The fact of the matter is that we want to make sure that the controls that were maintained and built into the Extract and Audit Act, because by and large, the Extract and Audit Act is the internal control framework mm -hmm. for the financial management system that exists today. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Fair enough. So, so okay, being a paper based on what have you. So, really and truly, the line of sight is very clear, particularly as it's a um, more or less paper based system. And which brings me now to in highlighting the, the deficiencies or the, the, where, where people would have taken advantage of the system. This will have, would show up in your, um, your management letters, which I recall to be extremely detailed. I can't remember if, if you, you all including that um, timelines for rectification or resolution. No, but what I do know is that they are extremely detailed. Now, if people are getting these management letters and they're um, ignoring them, and year after year, you go back to the same institutions and they have the same issues, I cannot understand um, that there's a kind of standing still or standing apart, or you cannot intervene or escalate this higher. Um, is, is the, am I correct or not correct? reporting mechanism as defined by the Constitution and defined by the Extract and Audit Act. Our report, we are reporting to the Parliament. That is our line of reporting. That is our oversight mechanism. I do agree with you, though, however, that a continuation of the, the issues that are raised on a continuous basis. But you must recall that it is not the same ministry sometimes that is having the same issue. Sometimes if you if you look at the report, Ministry of Agriculture, for example, just as an example, and I'm not saying that this is the case, but Ministry of Agriculture may have addressed the issues that we raised. And because we looked, um, we took a risk-based approach, we may have looked at another element. And during that element, we may have found other things that were in breach or needed to be improved upon. So sometimes it is not necessarily the same activity or the same breach or the same breakdown in control that is occurring. Now, in general, what we sometimes do is we do liaise with the control of accounts to identify things that we need to be addressed um, full, uh, from a holistic level. Again, I would like to say, I mean, we have not substantiated it, but I am aware that the control of accounts have taken certain directives where internal control is concerned. And I know they have been looking to improve upon the internal audit function because the internal audit function within ministries and departments are key to ensuring the integrity of the data, to ensuring and giving the accounting officers the assurance that the information that is being recorded is complete, accurate, and do in fact exist. So I do know that at present there are attempts by the ministry um, to improve upon the internal audit function and to deal with the uh, reform of the internal audit function. Right, Ch Chairman, I don't want to believe at this point, but um, Chairman, just through you, if I can ask two short, two other short questions, please. I'm just going to talk to them. Uh, Madam, I am looking at, um, there is on the page 45, I think there is something called a limitation of the audit of state month revenues, where there it seems as if there's a bottleneck or a stalemate between your function and the um, Board of Inland Revenue, specifically treating with Section 4 of the Income Tax Act, 
where you are seeking certain information which will help you in um undertaking a complete audit there's a it appears if there's a challenge there and since 2017 you have been seeking to have it resolved and you have brought it to the attention of the attorney general um where you are you are asking that they, they seek an interpretation summons to resolve whether you have um locus in in terms of getting the information you seek uh, you have also um, indicated that with the advent of the new attorney general, you have always also brought to his attention. How much is this interfering with your with your work as auditor general and in completing certain material audits? Well, when we speak about the limitation here, of course, we are speaking in terms of the revenue function. Now, the revenue statement is presented as a separate statement in terms of the presentation of the way the government accounts at present under the cash-based system is administered. So basically, we are talking about statements of receipts and disbursements, and we're talking about the receiver of revenue. Now, the BIR, the Board of Inland Revenue, is a receiver of revenue, and as you know, they collect revenue on the various tax provisions. So in order for an, any auditor to be assured of the completeness of, of something, they need to have access to information. Mm -hmm. However, the board is constricted by their act, um, their secrecy act, that would debar us from having detailed access to certain information to be assured that the taxes that was issued to Madam Jolene John, Jolene John was received by the board and was collected by the board. You know, so that is the challenge we have. Um, we do do, we have, um, because of this challenge, we do not stand back and say, okay, we can't audit it. Um, we do do spot service at the district revenue offices. And we do, at, at that point, uh, do observation, physical observation. We look at the collections. We look at the reporting. So we do try to minimize the risk. But of course, a, a strong auditing process would require us to have more access to the information to be assured that the revenue is being collected as it should be in accordance with the law. Uh, at this point, I don't know if I would like to, um, Ms. John, if you wouldn't mind, and through the chair, if our senior legal officer could add a little bit to this at this point in time. Thank you. With the chairman's permission, of course. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Yes, the legal officer. Good day, everyone. So we have obtained our own internal legal opinion. We maintain strongly that we have a constitutional right to the information that we're asking for from the Board of Inland Revenue. It is a position that we've always maintained. Um, however, at this stage, we've just not gotten any assistance with our position. Um, okay, Ch Chairman, my, my silent question, please. Thank you. Um, 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 Madam Auditor General, again to the Chairman, and uh, the section audit scope and approach at I think 2.4, 1.24, I think it is. Um, audit findings, payments made out of public monies to a member of parliament in accordance with section 25.2 of your act. And one went on to detail that, and it's, I think it's very helpful that one will always see for where you, um, from where you are given your authority. Where you, where you, um, and it is that basically, if a member of parliament, uh, which is president or deputy president of the Senate, speaker or deputy speaker, et cetera, receives any, anything that is outside of their normal remit, that this is um, reported within your report. And I'm, I'm seeing a, a specific 1.24, um, a specific payment. When such a payment is made, how um, in asking for the information, is it that it has to be approved by cabinet? You have to see a contract, the cap capacity of work, a sign off by someone to say this work was indeed done before. Well, a check would have been issued. By the time you get um, onto the compound, a check would have been issued. Is that how you conduct your um, the audit into a payment such as this? The requirement is under the Exchequer and Audit Act that the ministries and departments in preparing their notes to the accounts identify identify um, who is 
who has received finances or who has received payments um, that has it is not specifically linked or they've received payment in providing a service that is not in keeping with um, that particular piece of legislation. Um, for us, you know, when we verify the note, we would verify, as you rightly said, we would verify the, the actual payment and we would actually look at the service that is being provided. And for all services that are being provided, there needs to be some level of authorization. So we would verify to see whether or not such an authorization was granted to the receipt of such a payment. Okay, thank you. Chairman, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Madam Martin. Um, you Ms. Mark, Ms. Thank you. I want to turn to the statement of the public debt as referenced in your report, Madam Auditor General. At page 54, the report indicates that in addition to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, the public debt of Trinidad and Tobago was identified as a potential significant risk on the allocation of the resources of the state. Given that over the last few years, we've seen an increase in the level of the public debt to the point where it is now $97 billion as per your um, document. Can you identify, well, can you elaborate on what those potential risks are and what the potential consequences are to the economy of Trinidad and Tobago? That's a very difficult question for me to answer, sir, because I am not an economist. Unfortunately, I'm a lonely accountant. However, <laughs> however, as we know, at present, the, uh, the debt ratio, from my understanding and from my research and from what we have produced, is a roughly, approximately 82.7% of the, the debt ratio to the GDP. Now, that it would obviously that if you have to make loan payments and make commitments, which are mandatory and legally, and there are legal obligations to these things, that if you have to make these payments, um, then they would obviously be a priority over the expenditure um, for goods and services, for infrastructure development, for development programs. These obviously would have to take, they would obviously take it. So from that perspective is how we were looking at analyzing it to see whether or not, you know, whether there was a leveling off or whether there was an increase. Um, we, you, from our report, you would know that there was a slight increase from the previous year. So we were, and we were also looking to see whether or not the government was in fact making their payments, which we can attest to in the report that they have been. But we did not go all the way to link it um, to determine whether or not in meeting these payments, the impact it would have had on expenditure. Um, but from a personal level, and as a plug here for the Auditor General to receive more resources, our budget was definitely cut um, in this last financial year here. So it obviously did have an impact on us um, being able to, to, to put forward our work in the manner in which it should have been put forward. Um, primarily, we did not get the resources to, to fund the necessary um, staffing arrangements that we needed to have, nor the technical uh, tools in order to improve on our auditing techniques. So that we agree that the that the level of public debt has in fact affected um, your own funding. But from an accounting perspective, uh, as the Auditor General of the country, what would be your opinion of the level of comfort uh, that, let me ask that question that, that differently. As, as the accountant to the government, as the Auditor General, is, are we in a comfortable seat? Is this a good seat? Is it a, I would like to get your opinion as to the level of public debt, uh, whether it is in fact a, an acceptable level of public debt given the revenue and expenditure predicted by the government or, or on behalf of the government. Thank you, Chair, for that question. But again, it's a very difficult question for me to answer because, again, we have not done any analysis in that area. And um, point two, again, um, I am not an economist, 
and um, I do not have an, an economist um, expert on my on my as part of my team to really to be able to make a definitive pronouncement on that issue. Thank you, ma'am. If I may then turn that question to the Ministry of Finance to advise of the level of uh, concern that we should have as a country, given the level of public debt as it is at this point. Madam Permanent Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry for that delay. Um, my mouth was not cooperating. Um, so I would just like, Chairman, uh, just to make a slight correction. The public debt um, that was quoted, 82%, that would include open market operation. And what we what we use as our guide in the Ministry of Finance is the adjusted general government debt, which excludes open market operations. And I believe we would explain that in the review of the economy. Um, so taking that into consideration is approximately 77.9%. Um, to address your question directly as you as you um, may have alluded to chairman we would have been subject to reduced revenue over the period and with covid-19 we found ourselves having to to address certain anomalies in the economy, um, we would have had to, uh, as was discussed at length earlier, put in place several measures to support persons who would have lost jobs during the, the COVID-19 period when businesses would have been forced to close. In addition to that, we would have had to seek financing for pharmaceuticals, um, particularly um, drugs related to COVID-19. Um, additionally, with the loss of income, many households were not able to uh, pay for utility bills, etc. So the borrowing that you're seeing in the portfolio would have sought to address those issues particularly in, in supporting households in dealing with the fallout of the COVID-19. So um, in addition to we have existing portfolio which, uh, to address infrastructure so that the economy, when it, it starts to take off, um, the infrastructure needs would be able to, to support the growth that we are anticipating. Thank you, Madam Pierce. Uh, I'm raising that in in connection to the exchequer account, which is now overdrawn by $42 billion. So I have $42 billion overdrawn on the exchequer account and $97 odd billion dollars uh, in public debt. The question I was trying to get to is to whether or not there is some level of uh, concern um, because of that level of indebtedness, because of that level of borrowing, and because of that level of drawdowns from the exchequer, the overdrawn account, that is. And if there is, if there is concern, um, what is proposed to be done to have those matters addressed? Okay, Chairman. Um, the the issue of the public debt, as we we uh, continue to say, is that we need to support spending in the economy. All right, during the COVID nineteen, uh, we would have seen the effects of reduced spending in the economy. So 
we continue to seek to address expansion in the economy to bring uh, the, the economy to expand so that revenue can be earned so that uh, we can uh, service our debt and and uh, bring the the uh, spending so that the GDP would increase. Thank you, ma'am. Um, member Sipasad. Thank you, Chairman. Are, are you hearing me properly? I believe there were some issues with the audio just now. There is, in fact, some issue. We are not hearing you clearly. Um, well, my question deals with the accounting system, the cash base system, and when is the ministry going to implement an accrual based accounting system for the government accounts? Um, I think the permanent secretary can answer that question, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman. Could you, um, member, could you repeat the question, please? When will the government introduce an accrual-based accounting system to record its accounts? Um, because right now you use a cash-based system, and that affects the reporting of debt, etc., the correct reporting of debt. Okay, thank you, Chairman. I will turn over to the controller. Member, with the implementation of the integrated financial management information system, we are also looking to standardize the gains of accounting, which, be, which would be in accordance um, with IPSAS, International Public Sector Accounting Standards. However, the move would not, cannot be the move to accrual directly. We are moving from um, cash basis to cash basis episodes, to modify cash, then to modify accruals, and then possibly later on to a full accrual accounting. But this takes quite a number of years. So we have started with the introduction of cash based episodes um, standards. Thank you. Member Sipasad, does that answer your question? It answers it, but it's not satisfactory. I mean, how many years this is going to take? I'm not sure if the Ministry of Finance wants to give a response, please. But according to our information, the move towards accrual accounting could, can take up to 12 years. However, as I said, with um, international public sector accounting standards, we are still moving towards standardizing, which is with, with IPSAS, with the use of cash-based IPSAS. And that is going to be implemented along with the, the, the integrated system. I know that Member John had a hand up. I don't know if you still want to intervene, Member John. Very briefly, very briefly, Chairman. So then I wonder how do they then account for um, for expenses or revenues that has been collected, but not yet because it's, it is cash based. This is this was this real time. But then you have revenues that would have been earned that should be on your book. How do you then track that or debts? That they, you probably don't have um uh what you, what you call that disbursement for, uh, you know as yet because uh, again it is cash based. So if it is you have these um these revenues or debts um that ought to be accounted for, what is happening now is is it just placed somewhere and when the cash comes um you then do a matching of it? Sorry. Uh, I don't know. So the Ministry of Finance is in the Comptroller of Accounts through you, Chairman. I just want to know what happens now in, in terms of um, revenues that are not, um, you can't do this uh, what cash system for, but but it's there somewhere in it. It has to be accounted for. How do you do that? We, we do account for all revenue. Um, currently, with the cash based accounting, revenue is, is accounted for on a daily basis. Um, with, the, with the integrated system, it will be reported in real time, and therefore, we, we would have more information collected on revenue to be able to do better reporting. 
but the cash is reported um, on a daily basis as we see. But what about um, debts then? You, you, you have um, creditors, and these are material. You probably have consumed it, or it is going as part of a, some factor of production somewhere in the ministry. How is that accounted for if, if there's no vote or however it is um, recorded in the in the ministry? I, I don't know. If... Remember, yes, the revenue. Okay, fine. I could understand the cash is there, so you re re record that. But remember, is it that everybody pays on time and they pay by cash and that kind of thing, or...? or you will have cash to receive as receivables. In normal accounting, there are receivables, cash not yet received, and you account for that as something that is material on your books. Okay, Minister, um, remember if I can um, take a care. The, with respect to loans, which uh, uh, debt, the accounting officer, is required to budget the the projected expenditure from the loan, all right, and bring it to account as they draw down on the loan. Okay, so it is brought into budget. Okay. So I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. So if I'm an accountant, you, yes, I'm following, but I've been. I think maybe uh, I'm speaking as a. I'm thinking maybe more private sector, what is done in the private sector, that you must account for your receivables in, in the same way you have to um, account for um, debts that even if you cannot service the debts, you must account for them on your, on your books, real time. That is in, um, in keeping it standard accounting practice. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you want to go. Okay. So, um, so we do account for what is to come in, and we also have the, the projected servicing under expenditure. All right, thank you. Mm. Chairman, could I just follow up on that? Because I have a very serious concern that because based on, I mean, I'm, I'm jumping on to what um, Member John was talking about, the accounts are understated because if Absolutely. if we report on a cash basis, mm -hmm. you're understating your your assets, your liabilities, et cetera, revenue, expenses, et cetera. And 12 years is not a comforting number. Mm -hmm. So we continue to get, I would say, incorrect information when, when we look at the government accounts. Um, I would object, member. I would not say that the um, cash is understated. Um, when the accounts are done on a yearly basis at the end of the financial year, all the um, receipts and um, liabilities are taken into consideration in the statements that are produced. So they are shown um, on the account. On the book. It takes, it's because it's a month, um, it takes a longer time. Um, but it does, it, it is sure. But if you tell me that the accounts are done on a cash basis, then it is not an accrual based system. Is that correct? Chairman, I, I hope you don't mind, but I mean, I think this is something that, that we need to, to, to get some more information on. By all means. Sorry, can, can you repeat the question? Yes. What what I'm saying is you are reporting on a cash-based system, not an accrual-based system. Therefore, you are understating the liabilities, assets, etc., because cash is not accrual, unless I'm misunderstanding the method used in your accounting system. I'm still not quite sure I, I follow, but we have presented um, one of the statements, the consolidated statement of assets and liabilities in the cash based IFSA format, which is according to um, accountants in IFSA standards. And um, we have shown, for example, the liability of the exchequer account as a liability. In that statement, previously it was shown as an asset. 
But you now with that data that we have um, formatted, it should it is it is shown as a liability in the account. And is this for all assets, liabilities, income, and expenditure? Does it relate to all um, those categories? So this, these are expenses that are, that are due but not yet paid, income received and not yet entered, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you understand what a cruel-based accounting is. Um, does that relate to all the categories on the income and balance sheet? Um, I cannot say at this point. We will have to fill up. Well, could you provide us with details, please? Because I'm, that is something that I'm very concerned about, that we continue to get information that is not accurate when we look at the statements. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, do we have any more questions for the team here? All right, if there are no further questions, it falls to me to thank the representatives of the Water General's Department and the Ministry of Finance for your presence here today and your participation in today's uh, Public Accounts Committee meeting. I also want to thank members of the viewing and listening audience for tuning in and for submitting questions, uh, which we were able to raise on your behalf. Thank you again. And at this point, we'll ask that members of the Ministry of Finance and the Auditor General's Department will be excused and to wish uh, all citizens who are viewing uh, a really good day. Thank you all very much. Committee members, please hold so we can continue our discussion off camera. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, if I just may um, interject, please. I just wanted to add um, with regard to um, Ms. Christine's, Madam Christine's um, question, um, just for so some clarity here. The cash based system is international IFPA's cash based system is a recognized system for public sector accounting. Now, first world, 